This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. In recent weeks, Israel has found itself in an unprecedented situation, to say the least, following the October 7th attack. The nation is now facing simultaneous conflicts on three fronts, with a major campaign in Gaza, a mini war in the north, and another campaign in the West Bank. The strain on both the military and public patience has reached critical levels as Israel navigates through this multi-front challenge one of the biggest challenges since its founding. Zooming out to the bigger picture, the orchestration by Iran is becoming increasingly evident. The global stage is set for a potential war as Iran pulls the strings of various players like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Their actions threaten not only the stability of the region, but also the global economy, pushing Israel and the West to confront difficult decisions. As tensions rise, the question becomes, what steps should Israel and the Western world take in response to this intricate web of geopolitical challenges? To unravel these complex questions and simplify them for us, I'm sure, we turn to our most trusted expert, the man with the insights, Dr. Dan Shiftan. Dr. Dr. Dan, I like that. Dr. Dan is the head of the International Graduate Program of national security at the University of Haifa. He has a wealth of experience as a teacher at the IDF National Security College and Command and Staff College. His advisory roles for Israel's National Security Council and former Prime Ministers Yitzhak Rabin and Ariel Sharon, coupled with his prolific writings on Israel's national security, make him the go-to expert for understanding the intricacies of the current geopolitical landscape. Join us as we explore the analysis and recommendations of Dr. Dan on the unfolding events that have captivate, captivated the world's attention. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope Delighted I, to be here. I could have shortened it uh-huh. by just saying, you know, we with are, us today is the most brilliant man. We are the only people who are willing to shorten something before we even know how long it will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a wrap, you guys. We can end this now. <laughs> so, so please, uh, please share with us. What are we doing wrong? First of all, what have we done wrong that what have we brought done wrong? this on us? We misunderstood our neighbors, most of us, and I don't mean just the government, but also the security establishment, the intelligence establishment, the Israeli society, not because we didn't know what is going on, but because we we were not willing to fully understand what we knew and then implement what we need to implement knowing it. We didn't understand how deep the Palestinian commitment to the destruction of Israel and the killing of Jews is. We assumed that the Palestinians are a variation of ourselves. Uh, they speak Arabic, they hate us, they want to kill us, okay. They but like good food, we like good food. Uh, basically, we assumed that we come from the same value universe and we didn't fully comprehend And when I tried to say this to people, I constantly met with rejection that there is something fundamentally different in the political culture of the Palestinian people. I was very often asked, what are you trying to tell us? That they get up in the morning wanting to kill us? This is what they get up in the morning with? And when I said yes to this rhetorical question, they said, okay, we understand. Ideologically, this is what they want. But after all, don't they want a better life? And I said, a better life for them is to kill us. And the assumption was, a better life is what we would consider a better life. A society that has a constructive imperative at its core. And they don't. In their national body, there isn't a single constructive bone. Okay, now let me make two things very clear. A, this is not true about every individual Palestinian. I'm speaking about the collective and what motivates the behavior 
of the collective. And second, things can change. Let me elaborate on these two because it's important to qualify here. Individual Palestinians, I can say from my own experience, can be people similar to ourselves. But when you come to the collective and what motivates the collective and how they educate their children and finally what they decide to do when they have different options, a completely different political culture takes charge. First of all, every child hears from everybody, from all the agents of socialization, from his kindergarten governess, from his teacher, from his parents, from his writers, from his intellectuals, from his political leaders, from, from his... Um, from the TV, from the radio. From TV, from the radio, from the media. Throughout his life for a hundred years, one generation after the other, that Israel is inherently illegitimate. Israel was not only created in sin, not only came into being in a, a sin of colonialism, but we still are illegitimate because we are a colonial illegitimate entity. And the only way the Palestinians can build their future is on the ruins of our national life. This is what all their children for a hundred years get as a, the only diet, the only ideological diet. And not only in Gaza. Get. Not only in Gaza, not only Hamas. I don't think that it is surprising that we have between 75 and 90 percent support, depending on the public opinion poll, and in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and in the West Bank more than the Gaza Strip, that support the barbarism of October 7th. This is how they bring up their children. This is their life. This is their world. This is their value universe. And you don't think we internalize this? You don't think that the... We knew it and we didn't internalize it. We didn't. We said, yes, it's true. When I said it to people for many years, they said to me, you're right. And the evidence you bring is convincing. You don't think the majority but, of Israelis, meaning what I wonder is you don't think that it was, I, personally, I knew that. And I think we've been sp- speaking about it for, for years. What I didn't imagine was that it could happen. My na- naivety was the fact that, that the, the border with Gaza is is like a, is like a not a brick wall is like a like an invisible shield you can't break through it it would I couldn't imagine Look, the scenario that happened every wall can be broken that's not the problem. of course but what I'm wondering but is the is, question was is, that was that the the no the, no no the operational issue was not the most important it was the cognitive our unwillingness to accept that this is something that translates into the real world and real actions. This is ideology. But after all, we're giving them uh, petroleum and we're giving them water and we are uh, hospitalizing their ill in our hospitals. And uh, Israeli ladies drive them from the Arabs crossing to the hospital and back so that they will feel better. And we help them with export. But who you're and talking we about is... Everybody. The government and the opposition, the army and the intelligence community, everybody. But not the, the people. Yes, also, also the people. Also the people. Saying, yes, we know what they are. But after all, when we constantly improve their life, we can have a long-term arrangement, hasdara arukat vach, to use the Hebrew term. Mm-hmm. And for now, they won't do it. So, for, so from time to time, they will shoot some missiles. And actually, it's the rogue people in the um, Gaza Strip and all the others. And yes, they're being supported in the West Bank and among Israeli Arabs. But people actually know that they can't do anything very much. They can't do very much anyhow. So what they say is just to feel a little better. We didn't realize that the only thing that is stopping them from doing it for 100 years is when they think they can't achieve it. And even when they believe they cannot achieve it, but they still want at least to try to achieve it, they won't do it because why should they? Their life is getting better and better. They have a lot to lose. They 
let's give them something that they will lose. <laughs> and the point is that we are making the same mistake again and again for a hundred years because this understanding of what's going on happened to us again and again. In 1929, when they butchered the whole Jewish community in Hebron, we said, okay, now we get it. And we didn't, and we forgot it. And then in 47, and then in... 67, um, 73. Uh, well, no, not only in the big wars, but also when it comes to the massacres, also when it comes, when you have this barbaric behavior, this satisfaction of killing and decapitating yeah. and raping. The Fogel raping. family, for example. Uh, yeah. This has been there for a hundred years and this is what they're educated since their early childhood and they don't hear any other message. So, Vega. yes. But if maybe, to play the devil's advocate, if the chief of the IDF was here or the head of intelligence, they may be What if they told you to that? We knew what they're capable of. We knew the threat. But what, w- what would you have us do? Like, what that, would you have us do? Should we a, nuke Gaza and uh, get it over no, with? No, because you can't get it over with. But understand that you can't reach it. And by the way, I don't have to imagine if they were here. I was speaking to all of them for many, many years. Practically all of them are my students or my friends or people I work with or people I went to Miluim with. Okay, so it's not that I have to imagine what would they have said. I know what they actually did say. And by the way, with the best of intentions. And these are very good people and I have very deep respect for them. We wanted to forget every time we learned it. Look, we learned it in the Second Intifada. Because these barbarians wanted to kill our children in Tel Aviv and the Palestinian people supported the barbarians who wanted to kill our children in Tel Aviv, yeah. having nothing whatsoever to do with the occupation of the West Bank. Also or in the knife in 2016, same. Again okay, but how and again it, and again for a hundred years. How do We you explain ex- it? How do you explain like the, the fact that the current leadership... Not just the current leadership. And the leadership. previous, how do you explain this phenomenon of forgetting and forgetting Everybody and forgetting? Everybody wants to forget because they want to tell themselves a story. Why? Because, because they don't want to have to deal with the problem. Because otherwise, Exa- that's what I'm, I'm saying. being told, otherwise, what are you trying to tell us? That we will live on our sword? Yes. What's wrong with it? But By the way, would you have them people do? live on their swords. Always. All people always. always live on their swords. By the way, when you are living in an environment when, where there is crime and the possibility of rape and uh, mugging and murder, you live on the sword of the police, right? You say, here are the people who will fight these people with violence. Because the only way you deal with a violent barbarian is having better violence. Okay, you can try to educate him if you live in La La Land. You can try to make a rapist into a poet if you live in La La Land. But those people who really are determined to do it, you have to break them. And when the Europeans tell us, how can you live on your sword? The Europeans live on the American sword. Were it not for the American sword, Hitler would dominate Europe or Stalin would dominate Europe or Putin will uh, um, dominate Europe. So everybody lives on his sword. The only question is, can you combine, and this is the challenge of Israel, being part of vis-a-vis your enemy and essence inside and towards your enemy. friends at the same time it's a very difficult balance how can you on the one hand destroy and rain havoc on your enemies as we do today as we speak in the Gaza Strip and have a democratic society a pluralistic culture developed science open to the world at the same time we are met with We meet this challenge more than anybody else in the democratic world because we are in the middle of a region, and let me make this very clear because it's very difficult to understand. In this region, in the Middle East, there are only two options. 
either somebody is afraid of you or you have to be afraid of them. If they're not afraid of you, you can't talk to them. You can't cooperate with them. You can't reach a settlement with them. This is a precondition. They need to be afraid of you to know that if they push you too far, you can go as far as they and beyond. So let, let me put it in, in American terms. Go ahead. Once there was a little girl and she had a little curl in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. I don't know if you still use this nursery rhyme. Maybe it's too old for some people. But if you can't be horrid and people are not afraid of you, you can't speak to barbarians. Now, among ourselves, our kind of people, we need to be open and we need to make compromises and we need to give them the benefit of the doubt and we need to be civilized because they are civilized. But what happened when your neighbors are not civilized? I don't know if you heard the stories that the angels came to the Almighty and said, you love the Jews too much. Why is it that you give them so much and support them so much and love them so much? And God said, wait until you see what neighbors I've given them. Okay, so if you live in this region and your neighbors are people like Assad, a barbarian, a 24 karat barbarian who just butchered 600,000 people of his own, okay, he wouldn't butcher our people. Why? Because we smile nicely, because somebody in CNN or BBC says that you should all get along with each other and ride our unicorns into the sunset. Why? So w let me let me ask you a question real quick, which is, you say we didn't internalize and we are in this continuous cycle of forgetting. Have we internalized now that For the, a while. the 7th of October has happened? Have we internalized? Are we doomed to forget again? For a while. In 20 years, you, we will have a new generation of idiots who will say, yes, this is true and this really happened. But after all, are they not people like us? So there's, there, so we're doomed. We can't break there's the no, circle. There's no, no breaking the cycle. No, we are not doomed. We are in an excellent situation. Look. We'll just have to sacrifice 1,400 people every 10, 20 years. So? No, but I'm, is that, that's the... No, what I'm saying is, look at the last 100 years. We've had it, exactly this, for 100 years. And we were much, 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 much weaker we're a hundred times better off than we were a hundred years ago and 80 years ago and 50 years ago and 30 years ago. And in these 100 years, we had the same repulsive neighbors and we had here, and we still have, one of the greatest successes of any country in the world. I lived here for many decades through many wars and I have a very good life, a much better life than I would have had if, God forbid, I lived in California. Okay, so you learn to live with the fact that this is your region. You want to lie to yourself. Okay, it makes you happy. It's okay. But for a hundred years, we've done it. It's not, can we do it? We have already done it under much no, more difficult we circumstances. We don't have to accept the fact. I mean, I granted. Don't accept. Wait, granted, the, granted we're probably always going to need to fight wars. And we're, we're always going to have to send our young, able bodied men and women sometimes also to fight on the front and to be violent like you said in order to 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 beat off the barbarians but do we have to accept the fact that every once in a while we'll have this massive invasion of rape burning and uh, no, decapitation no we should have been prepared for it and we were not and this in itself is a major a failure that we have to learn from and prevent. But remember, every democracy was always unprepared for war. How prepared was the United States for war in 1941? Or for that matter, in 1939, in the beginning of the Second World War? How prepared was Britain? Democratic societies always cheat themselves because they start from the assumption that barbarians are like us. By the way, look at what happened in Europe. You know, for a long period of time, I had a name in Europe, particularly in Germany. They called me Mr. Retro. 
because they said to me, you come to us and you speak to us about wars, about Russian barbarians, about occupation. What are you talking about? You're coming from the first part of the 20th century. You didn't even upgrade your thinking to the middle of the 20th century. We're in the 21st century. We live in an environment of interdependence where the international community... Deter there is no such thing as international community. It is a figment of the imagination of people in La La Land. Okay, what is the international community? The barbarians that control the United Nations? You have 200 nations there, the overwhelming majority are authoritarian, totalitarian, or barbarian, and everything is determined by the majority. So what do you expect of the United Nations? That it will be the international community with the Libyans and the North Koreans and the Syrians and the Cubans will determine what human rights are? They, don't, they can't even spell it. They don't even know what they're bullshitting about. So this is the international community? No, but you do have allies and enemies and of partners course. in trade and commerce. Of course. And so, and so there is an international community, maybe more so in the 21st century in the sense that no, there is more... No. There is more interconnectivity between nations. Yes, but interconnectivity we also had with Hamas, okay? They connected with us on the 7th of <laughs> October, and we are connecting with Khan Yunus today. Don't yeah. give me this. Connection is not necessarily something positive that brings you together with people. Now, inside Western Europe or Central Europe, you have a bunch of civilized nations who did something very impressive. I mean, remember... Uh, only a century ago, Europe was a, a slaughterhouse, okay? And now it is a, a, a continent of peace and democracy and freedom and... And, uh, and a million plus uh, Arab... Syrian uh, uh, invaders. Uh, immigra immigrants. We'll come to that. This was yeah. the, the folly of Europe, not understanding that if you bring in people with this kind of political culture that I've now discussed, people who ruin their own countries because of their political uh, culture exclusively. They the, flipped it in inside out. They're Sparta on the inside and Athens no, on the, the outside. Uh, Why do you no, call it? No, no, they're Sparta on the outside and the inside and what have you. Okay? So these people who destroyed their own countries with their repulsive political culture brought their political culture with them into Europe. Why do you separate political culture from culture? Because it, I want to make sure that it has nothing to do with literature or music or things that you cannot judge in terms of this is better or this is worse, okay? But when it oh, comes to... Oh, but their music the, is, will kill the Jews, will kill ju the Jews. No, no. <laughs> this it is, has to do... This is the libretto. Okay, but uh, you can't say, look, I like Western music and I can't, can't stand Eastern music, but I'm not saying Western music is superior, okay? Mm -hmm. They're different, okay? Sure. Food, music, what have you, literature, okay, I can be multicultural on this. Oh, but, you're but when it comes to issues mm -hmm. relating to pluralism, I am superior, they are inferior, and I must dictate to them when they come to me my superior culture of pluralism to their inferior culture of barbarism, okay? Attitude to women, you, you couldn't say, yeah. okay, they treat their women like cattle, we treat them like human beings and equally, so the different culture. No, they're inferior, we are superior. You know what, I have a good example to bring, unfortunately, from the colonial period, but the story is nice. Napier, the governor of India, has issued a decree forbidding sati. This is a, an Indian custom of burning widows alive when their, when their husbands die. So they told him, you cannot forbid it. It's a custom. And he said, you're right. I cannot forbid it. Tradition. The Indians have a custom of burning widows alive. We British have a custom of hanging people who burn widows alive. So you proceed with your custom, and then we will proceed with ours. <laughs> this is more or less my attitude towards Touché. multicultural political culture. Again, people can be Muslims or Jews or Christians or Buddhists or without religion or whatever, whatever they want. This is legitimate. This is acceptable. But when it comes to the question 
of how do you behave vis-a-vis the other person. Are you pluralistic or are you trying to impose your way of life somebody el- uh, on somebody else? This, to me, is not an open question where you can have a pluralistic attitude. I want to take us to the... Let's okay. bring it back, yeah. Okay. I, I want to take us to the campaign in Gaza. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because there's a question that's been on my mind for the past few weeks, and I have to lay it on you. Soldiers die uh, every day, 5, 10. Uh, it was a particularly bad weekend. And I'm just wondering, what are they dying for, really? Our soldiers. Because oh, they are dying for something very important, and they know it. They are risking their life. They don't come to the battlefield to die. They're willing to risk their lives mm-hmm. so that the barbarians don't get away with it. Oh. Which is why What does anybody mean, calling for a ceasefire is immoral. Immoral, fundamentally immoral. Because they basically say the barbarians can kill civilized people and then civilized people should not respond because... Uh, the population of the barbarians may be hurt. If we, God forbid, had these people in 1942-1943, Hitler would win the war. Because how can you possibly bombard Germany? I mean, innocent civilians are being killed. So when you say stop the war, your eyes are so stupid that you don't understand that you're immoral. Or you're immoral because you're basically saying, let the barbarians get away with it because they embedded themselves in civilian population. But what does it mean to not get away with it? For us, what does it mean? It, it means that they will regret having done so and we will destroy the instruments that that made it possible for them to do it, to destroy their infrastructure, to kill their people and their leadership, to see to it that their ability to do it to us will be brought down dramatically. Now, can we impact their motivation? No. They are barbarians, okay? By the way, let me say something, a qualification that I should have brought before. Can the Palestinians change one day? Yes. I mean, political culture... can change. In Turkey, we had two dramatic changes in political culture in one century. A hundred years ago with Mustafa Kemal at the Turk in the positive direction, and 20 years ago with this barbarian with Erdogan in the wrong direction. So political culture can change. But the assumption that we had that if it can change, it must change. And if it must change, it must change posi- positively. And if it must change positively, it has already started to change. This is a fantasy that we cheated ourselves into accepting. But And infrastructure can be rebuilt. Yes. No. D- we will destroy it when it is rebuilt. This is a, the <sighs> second lesson that we have learned, that we should be Not offensive, not defensive, but offensive. When they can do something, we destroy it because be, they let me, can. Let me, let me ask a more practical question. What, I mean, you have extensive experience in this area. So what do you think, if you were to, if they came to you and said, and maybe they did, give us number, five objectives for the war. Concrete objectives. What would you make the them? The most ob- important objective of the war is, is to hit Hamas very, very, very hard, including the destruction of the infrastructure they have built in Gaza, which is the most elaborate and the most developed anywhere in human history, designed to prevent an army from getting what the army wants. And therefore, we, it takes time. And therefore, we lose soldiers. By the way, in the first day, When we were not prepared, we lost 350 soldiers. Now, in months of fighting, we've lost 150. Okay, so even when it comes to losses, always be offensive. Don't wait for him. Don't respond to their aggression. Assume that if they can, they will, and destroy them before they start. By the way, this is what we're doing in Syria with, for, for a decade now with Iranian weapons to Hezbollah. 
once they get into Syria, we destroy them. We don't wait for them to be ready. So, so eradicate their infrastructure and their ability to fight. And kill as many Gaza. of them as possible. Okay, so hit Hamas yes. as hard as you can everywhere in all the ways possible. Yes. What would be number two? Number two is you every say also time, there shouldn't be anything. every time they have something that they can use against you, destroy it. Don't wait for them to attack. Okay. I don't need an excuse. When a barbarian, when a serial killer comes into this room with a knife, he's not bringing the knife to cut tomatoes. He is a Syrian killer. Syri- so I, I will... A serial, by the way, not Syrian. <laughs> Although it could it, be it, it rhymes. It's a real tongue twister. Yeah? If there's it, a Syrian yeah, it, serial it, it, killer, it rhymes. <laughs> it, it rhymes. It's yeah. very, it's very closely related. Yeah. Okay, so when they have it, destroy it, okay. and then the New York Times will hate you. But that's long term. This is years, a year term strategy. Meaning, dis- what what should be the But goals now, for the, over the next because 12 months? The destruction of Hamas. It okay. will take a long time. Now, also, pushing Hezbollah away from the border, willing to take the risks that it will develop into a very major war with Hezbollah. Okay. okay? And... Give a tank would be destroyed, just saying. Okay. <laughs> Okay, if I have to, I'd rather pay the painful price today than the catastrophic price later. Let me put it this way. If you were the leaders of the free world in 1939, you could have said, as they said until 1938, let's do whatever we can to prevent war. This is exactly the appeasement of Hitler. Hitler. Whereas the response should have been in 1935. Let's destroy Hitler because this is what he will inevitably do. It doesn't look good. Let's do what doesn't look good. Because the number one weapon that the barbarians have against civilized people is our need to look good. Don't try to look good. If they love you, you must have done the wrong thing. Okay? If, if everybody loves you, you must have been irresponsible. So... We should be unless of- you're Tom Hanks. We should be offensive, not defensive, not to wait until we are attacked. Ag- agreed. A hundred percent. So, but I want to follow through with the the question and and you can say that there is no three, four, five. But are there other objectives in your mind? do do should we consider, and I'll just i'll 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 uh, flesh it out should should we consider the uh, hostage the return of the hostages yes. as an objective of the war and should we at any point talk about uh, conquering the land and reinhabiting no. it no for example Con- look conquering the land I only need for operational reasons namely in order to destroy the infrastructure of Hamas and to kill as many of them as possible and to try to prevent them from rebuilding it why God willing in the 2150 a hundred and something years from now when Israel is 50 million large we'll need more place for I don't need homes. more place I But don't isn't need it the place. only currency they really care for is it something that I'm willing to do for instance if I get the territory will I get it without the population I Yes, you can't. Why? The North Because of we're Gaza in the was... 21st century. 200 years ago it would have been possible. But you said we don't care about no. what people say. No, 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 no. The question is, look, the most serious restrictions morally on the Israeli army don't come from the New York Times. It comes from the Israeli public. We, uh, the Israelis. You don't all... think the Israeli public wants no. uh, Gaza? No. No, and even if the Israeli public wants it today, it will not want it in 15 years. Ask me what the Israeli public wants. Okay, not the Israeli public. Okay? Beca- what do you mean? Because people at the heat of the moment in the middle of the war want things that they shouldn't want to want. But why? This is why we're here. Because no. we took land. No. By power. No. What no. do you mean? Why not? We are here because... In, in, to, here you mean in the war. No. No, no here, saying, here in Israel here in proper time, today. We took it by force, this land, from we, the Arabs. So what's no, the difference? No, they were not the owners of it. They lived here. Look, if you want to go back, okay, 
uh, who took America from the um, Native uh, Americans? Indians? From the Native Americans? Who took Australia from the... Op- yes. Okay, so let's try and rearrange the world and look at the kind of values that you have in Harvard today and bring them back 500 years back and then rearrange the world. And you know what? You can be an academic. If you're so completely <laughs> cut off from reality, become an academic. My argument is, is way more simple. My argument is this. Every square meter... You, let's say now we conquered North, North Gaza and eventually will withdraw and leave a s- security parameter. My, my argument to you is every square meter we withdraw from will be used to launch rockets. Now yes. you say yes, yes, let's attack it again and again, go yes. in and go out, go in yes. and go out. Why? Why because, should I go in and go out? Because and risk the my, population just... comes with the territory. You cannot do what you would have been able to do two and three hundred years ago, namely remove the population. It's impossible. Says who? But we did Says it. Says the Israeli... No, we never did it. We did it 70 years ago. No. Eh, 75 no, years ago. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You need to learn Israeli history. Why? 700,000 no. odd uh, yes. Arabs and were... I'm delighted they did. But I'm delighted they say this was a civil war. They were fighting us in a civil war, and then they decided to leave the overwhelming majority of them. And the, the, the inhabitants of northern Gaza decided to evacuate to the south, But no, leaving it no, almost, no, no, almost no, essentially no. empty. We forced them to leave, and also in 1948, they tried to destroy our very existence and failed. And then in the war, they decided they want to leave, okay? So they left, not because we pushed them out. You know what? Perhaps 10%, 15% we pushed out. But the overwhelming we'll majority... Shove. Pardon? We shoved them. Again, no. Like, some about is- 10%, 15% of them. Mm-hmm. Okay? I'm delighted they left. I'm delighted no. we didn't let them in to, to come back. So why not again? I, prevent, I, don't, I don't understand. Because it can't be done. Okay, Israelis will not do it. That's two different arguments. It, no. It can be done. It can't be done because Israelis won't do it. No, it okay? can't. It, wait, wait, hear me out. I'm saying it can be done, but we don't it, want it to be done. It's two different things. Yes. That's what you're saying. It can't be done because we won't do it. The most important restriction on human behavior doesn't come from external circumstances. It comes from a set of values. Again, culture. Whatever you discuss, you come back to culture. We are the kind of people who don't want to do it. And if I... I, 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 would, I, uh, I challenge that. I don't, I don't think there's any proof to show. I mean, again, it's not like I can pull up a, a poll from yesterday. No, there that shows, a po- I have a poll from but, yesterday. But I there really poll- find it hard to believe that Israel is. There was a poll from yesterday. It's a poll, you know. As Shimon Peres said, only sniff it Please and don't, don't drink it. Please don't remind me on Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres. <laughs> okay. I want to remain serious <laughs> okay. and intelligent. <laughs> anyway, the poll said that 60% of Israelis are for evacuation of Maybe. Gaza. To They're the wrong 60%. Because, to Canada, to Germany. Look, to... this is a fantasy. Okay? It won't happen. So, look, I'm not against fantasies. I have fantasies of my own, <laughs> and I don't care to elaborate Hopefully on them. Hopefully they don't involve no. us. No, 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 no. I'm straight. <laughs> okay. Okay? So, no, they don't involve you. Okay. But even the fantasies that I have that don't involve you <laughs> no. is not something that I allow to dominate my life. I want to remain within the real world. Okay? And... Even if you have a poll in the middle of a war where 60% want it, no. the 40% are the people running this country. But you're not solving my, my pro- kind of okay. people. But if, let's go to the north, okay? You hit Hezbollah because we were already there. What was the security parameter in the 80s and 90s, right? We, were, we took the land, we pushed them out, we withdrew from the land, We got again the rockets, which is why and we started war- Lebanon, first Lebanon war in and the first place. And here is our mistake, both in Gaza and in Lebanon. Once we pulled out and Hezbollah came in, we should have attacked Hezbollah. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. You know, no, that I'm old sorry. Saying. This is the message. This is the lesson we're learning now. But history shows, sorry for pushing back at you, but I think this is really core. History shows, tells you 
Dr. Shifton, that the Israeli government, the Israeli military, the system, the judicial advisors, they simply won't let you do that. You know, it's not in our DNA to... This is what changed. You see, what you're saying is a change of 100% is possible, but the change of 20% is not possible. Exactly. This is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. So I'm telling you, being <laughs> Israel... Okay? okay, you know, I'm furious at Louis XIV because he plagiarized from me the term l'état c'est moi. Okay, the state is me. I'm uh-huh. Israel. Okay. Okay? okay, if I'm against it, it won't go. We can and will, when we withdraw from Gaza and they come through the parameter or build a collection of rockets, we will attack them. We will not wait for them to attack us. This is what will happen. Watch. Not good enough. I'm sorry. I'm not, think, I'm, not, I think, I'm not putting your... I think, no, I think you're suffering from the same naivete that you're claiming no. other people are. Meaning this is exactly what we've been doing. No. So you're saying it's just... No. A, hold on. You're saying it's just a matter of nuance. How no. much we attacked no. and how much... No, no. We, Their assumption was by being nice, we can prevent them from doing what they want. My assumption is by being nasty... We can prevent them from having what they need in order to do what they want. But we did operations in Gaza in 2014, 2008. Yes, but we did like was, five operations in the last yes, decade. Yes, but all of them were of the wrong kind. But that's a, as good okay, as it gets so in Israel. No, wait, no so, so what are the right this kind? This is what we've learned now. So what's now, the right kind? Will we unlearn it in 30, 40 years? I don't know. But will at least the next decade or two decades or so be characterized by Israel being offensive. Wherever there is a problem, first attack, then we will have a concept about it, okay? Mm-hmm. The concept is, if you have it, you will use it. So let's deprive you of it and kill you, okay? And once you, I kill you, it's difficult for you to do it. But you don't and, solve the core and problem. And the dumb, oh, you only, here, you only... thank you. Thank you for making this comment. Here is the difference between me and you. Mm-hmm. You're looking for a solution. Nahon. Okay? Here is the difference between smart guys and people who will be smart later. <laughs> okay? Yes. Here it is. And by the way, this is exactly what I'm teaching. I'm mm-hmm. teaching strategic thinking. The operational people say, here is a problem, what is the solution? The strategic thinker says... What is my response to a situation that doesn't have a solution? I start with the assumption of no solution. Okay? Now, when I try to persuade people that there are situations where there are no solutions, there are two ways I'm trying to do it. Either analytically by showing them that crime has no solution and poverty has no solution. Everything important in life doesn't have solution. You can bring back crime or poverty from unacceptable level to an acceptable level, but you cannot eliminate it. But a good welfare state can bring it down from an unacceptable level to an acceptable level. A good a judiciary or law enforcement system can bring crime down from an unacceptable level. And this is one way. The other way is much more direct and painful. I ask people, how many in the audience are married? And if you are married, do you still believe problems have solutions? Hmm. And then usually the men nod very sadly and finally realize there are some problems that don't have solutions. The problem we have the, with the Palestinians has no solution. One day in 200 years, maybe they will resurrect Shimon Peres with his <clears throat> dumb fantasies and And maybe when unicorns are flying around, we will also have a solution. But as long as there is no solution, and this is generations, because this is how they bring up their children, we need to see to it that we can be what we are, namely a productive a, a society that tries to engage in nation building. 
and we are trying to build a better democracy and a stronger economy and a more uh, efficient army and a more pluralistic uh, culture and a better medicine and, and fine uh, science and so on. And alongside this, we can only fight away our enemies. No, but no one's claiming we're going to solve the Palestinian problem. Meaning, oh, first thank of all, you. there's plenty of Palestinians and Palestinian problems to solve from the West Bank to the Gaza Strip. But we're talking specifically about the Gaza Strip. And we're not even talking about necessarily it conquering all of the Strip. But even if we were to conquer all of the Strip, we've seen how Palestinian refugees end up living in Kuwait and in uh, around so, the world and continuing to so be a problem. So you want us to occupy so Kuwait? Saying, no, so I'm saying... I, I want to do what you're saying and be more offensive. I want to push them back as far It's as... It's impossible because people will not accept them in. The Egyptians will not do it. No, but the okay. Egyptians have been uh, uh, more warm to the idea of at least letting them pass no, through. I, pass through, yes, but they're to afraid... Canada, they're to Canada, stick- Uh, the Canadians will not that let them in because Trudeau once was like, I want you know the Scotland. The you want to fantasize, fantasize. I, I'm not against. I agree. I want to capitalize. I don't want to. I don't want to fantasize. Look, you're speaking about the Kuwaitis. The Kuwaitis had hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, and they had a good life there. And then the barbarian Saddam Hussein came, so the barbarian population welcomed the barbarian conqueror, and then the Kuwaitis threw them out. And Arabs can throw other Arabs out. Jews can't throw Arabs out because the Jews won't do it. Okay? So, yes, you're frustrated because there is no <laughs> solution. Okay? So, you should be an engineer. And engineers should think in terms of problems, solutions. Okay? I expect the engineer to provide solutions. When it comes to the matters that I'm dealing with, Thinking about solutions is simple, simple, uh, simple-minded. It doesn't work. So try to do damage control. Try to find a response to the problem, which may not be a solution, but is a good response. Again, think of your marriage or somebody else's marriage, okay? What do you do? When you have a good response, you should be happy. So a good response is not a solution to the problem, is drawing a line in Gaza right in the middle from, between the north and the south and saying this is now Israel. I think First of it, all, I'll tell you another thing. It'll put us in a wonderful position for negotiations for the release of the hostages. You know what? I'm willing I to give that not, half back. But at least we should come and say, well, at okay, least we so should now you're put our tactics. balls on the table and say, you okay. know what? This isn't yours anymore. Okay. You want to talk? Maybe. Give us back our hostages and maybe okay. you get a half of it back. I'm not arguing with tactical approaches. You, you're asking me where is it going and then you revert to a question that we have on the agenda now. And I'm for pushing them with whatever is possible and if this works, I'll consider that. But please stop thinking about Gaza stopping to be a problem. My grand, grand, grandchildren <laughs> will fight in Gaza because we have a barbarian people as a neighbor. I think, Dr. Shifton, you know, history will judge. I think you're wrong about the Israeli people. I think after October 7th, what we will see in the upcoming decades is... People who maybe are who think like Ben Gvir, but but wait, hear me out, but uh, but not our Ben Gvir in better, you know, better, more uh, masks, but people from the far right will rise to power. No, no, that's where I think we're going. Not. Definitely not. That's where I think. Look, we're going uh, first of all, term. I've had the, so many yeah. cases when people told me what I was wrong. And once even I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. <laughs> okay? So after the second intifada, people also came with solutions. And yeah. remember, in the intifada, in the second intifada, parents who had both of their children in the same school would send them to school on different buses saying maybe the Palestinians will only kill one of my children rather than two, as the Palestinian Smart. people wanted. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then they also told me about this. You need to be able to look at the broader 
picture, and I'm telling you, don't engage in fantasy. There's one more thing I want to touch, uh, and I'll ask- I hope it's not me. Uh, no, not, <laughs> not yet. Um, because if we go with your, uh, with your thinking, what he means, and correct me if I'm wrong, we need to strike in Iran ASAP. No, we need to strike in Iran when it is appropriate and helpful. First of all, uh, we need the United States. The United States cannot and should not be drawn by Israel into a war the American people don't want. Our relations with the United States are excellent in spite of the young people of America, the dumb people. people of America. The younger and the more educated you are, the dumber you are. Okay, we just had proof of it. You're referring But, to the poll that yes, says 18 yes. to 24-year-olds, 51% yes, of yes, them support Hamas. Yes, yes, yes. And by the way, it's not only that they support the destruction of the State of Israel. At the same time, they say the, ex- the, the extreme opposite. I mean, they're confused. They But live in TikTok. Speech. These yeah. guys don't know what they're talking about. They've been inflicted by, ac- by American academia. Okay? They should be rehabilitated from being exposed to American academia. <laughs> so, and particularly the Jews among them. Okay? So yeah. it's, it's really, it's, it's repulsive and laughable, their attitudes. But if you look at the overall picture, we are number three or number four in terms of popularity in the United States. Our popularity in the United States is higher than that of NATO. higher than that of the American Supreme Court. So we're in good shape, basically. We could have been in better shape if everybody would have agreed with me, but this would have fixed the world in so many different ways that this is only one of them. When you come to look at the long-term picture here, we will have to live with a continued challenge on a very high level that we are more and more capable of meeting. Let me put it this way. Very often when I present my picture, an idiot from the audience says to me, you're a pessimist. And I said, no, I'm a smart optimist. And here is the distinction between a dumb optimist and a smart optimist. A dumb optimist says things will be better. And a smart optimist says things will get worse but I will get stronger faster than things get worse. In other words, the gap between the good guys and the bad guys in my favor will grow. In Iran, we shouldn't destroy our relations with the United States by doing something that looks good. We need to be very careful about what we're doing, hurt Iran where it hurts Iran, the most, try to bring America to our side. By the way, the Houthis are really helping us. I would have paid for my own misery university salary for the missiles the Houthis sent to Israel because the understanding that Iran is a danger to civilized humanity, okay? Much more dangerous than North Korea, the most dangerous country in the world because all the other barbarians who have nuclear power North Korea and the, uh, uh, Pakistan need it for defensive purposes. Iran needs to give itself nuclear immunity in order to be offensive in a way that will change the world. And the more people realize it, the better. Now, is it very difficult? Yes. Are the Iranians smart? Yes. Can we outsmart them in the long run? Yes. But we must be very careful again. not looking for solutions. So, so what is the moment to capitalize on? Meaning, it, like, because you're, you're not very hawkish in the sense, in, in preemptive, in a preemptive sense, like in, in preemptive sense. I'm strength. trying to be smart, not so what, hawkish what, and not dovish. So can you give, like, when do, do you see war happening with Iran Maybe in the with United Trump. States? Trump how, how do you see a likely First scenario? First of all, I, where we deal am, with the Iranian problem. I am delighted with what is happening in Gaza today in the sense that I'm sending a message to all our enemies and to all our friends. 
to our enemies in Beirut. I'm saying, you want to see how Beirut will look like if you make war against Israel? We will destroy you. And we don't care if uh, Judy Buckler thinks that we are exercising genocide. Okay, because this kind of uh, value low life approach doesn't affect us. Number one. Number two. Our allies in the Middle East, the Arab allies in the Middle East. Here is the interesting paradox. Our situation in the Middle East is excellent. The best I, it ever was. Because most Arabs understand not only that they have to acquiesce with our existence because we are so strong, but also that they can't do without us. They need us. We are the strongest and most determined element who must fight with their worst enemies, Iran and the Muslim Brothers. They want us to win in Saudi Arabia and in the Emirates and in Morocco and in Egypt and in Jordan more than most of the Israeli Knesset. But are, okay? isn't Saudi Arabia now uh, uh, in negotiations Flirting. with Iran so, through the Chinese? So you always negotiate you with think, your enemies. You think it's just, uh, it's just they a show? No that we can be trusted, unlike Obama, the worst thing that happened to America in foreign policy, President Obama, that basically said, I'm with the bad guys and I will undermine the good guys. Okay, this is what he did. The worst president I can imagine in foreign policy. I know nothing about Obamacare or anything about domestic issues. Biden tried to appease the Iranians. I'm delighted to say he failed, but at least he supported Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. And he's supporting Israel now in a very impressive way. Yes, yes, in a very impressive way. Could he just spoke about two weeks ago, he spoke about uh, in his speech to APAC, he was talking about the states. fact that we need the Palestinian state. And so, so, I mean, if I were the American president and I had the uh, progressives threatening me, I would also tell them something about a Palestinian state. Let them talk about... Look, when it comes to the Palestinian... They asked me, very, what do I think about the Palestinian state? And I said it in a way that some people did not appreciate. I said, fake it. Okay? It works on so many levels. It will work here too. Fake it. Okay? Can anything good come out of the Palestinians? Absolutely nothing. When you have a Palestinian nation builder, a person, by the way, I respect very much, Salam Fayyad, Okay? Did he ever have more than 2% support of the Palestinians? No. There is something profoundly wrong with the Palestinian people because their political culture is obsessed with what they consider to be historic justice. And I explained before what I meant by it. But do they need to say two-state solution? A Palestinian state was never before more distant than today. Because what does a Palestinian state mean if, God forbid, somebody is stupid enough to accept a fully sovereign state? They will bring Iran 15 kilometers from here. Because this is how they educate their children. Look at their leaders. Yeah, but that's what happened. They but can only so have... you're saying this is just the lip service of to course. the progressives? I don't even care if he means it or not. It will not happen. It will not happen because the Palestinians are too impotent, too repulsive, too corrupt. And a campaign too, against Iran yeah, will happen? A campaign, yes. A war, I'm not sure. A campaign, yes. I think the Americans are slowly beginning to understand that Iran is not a Middle Eastern issue. It extends to India. It extends to the Red Sea. It, it extends to everywhere in the world. These are barbarians. This regime must be destroyed. Whatever is bad for this regime is good for civilized human beings. You cannot reach a compromise with the Iranians. They are the enemies of civilized humanity. Now, by the way, 
if you get rid of this regime, the Iranian people are the second greatest hope in the Middle East. Okay, they're very impressive. Once they get rid of the barbarians, of the lowlifes that are in charge today. You think the majority of Iranians... I don't care. The, the, no, I'm asking if you, you don't think the regime represents the majority of Iranians. I don't care. Ah, well... I care that there is a very strong nucleus in Iran of people who want a pluralistic Iran. And this is a very impressive people. Even if they take power and hold it through authoritarian means? You're, that, you, think that's, uh, you think it's sustainable? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Look, democracy is something that you need to bring in very, very carefully. The idea is that you come in and bring democracy. Look, if there is somebody who doesn't know what they're saying and doesn't know what they're doing, it's the Americans, okay? First, they wanted to bring democracy to Iraq with a great success. Then women's rights to Afghanistan and now peace to the Palestinians, okay? So when they talk to us about endgame, all their endgames always failed because they think in terms of solution. You see, they call Israel the startup nation. I hope we are. If I had to name the Americans, I'll call them the, the checklist nation. When I think about an American, I think about him with a board, with a clipboard, and doing this, you know, checks, <laughs> things. And what would be a good end game? Peace in Iraq. So let's bring peace to Iraq. You need to have a very developed sense of humor. Just a, This is like a detour, but when do you think that? Because America was for centuries the greatest nation on earth it is i think and it still is it still is but you're saying they, they do that by in doing spite by of its universities yes because okay. they can reinvent themselves i mean look at america in the great depression and how it came out of the great depression okay i have great faith in america the only point is americans are simple-minded okay today we have freedom in the world thanks to america Were it not for the United States, we would be dominated by the likes of Hitler and Stalin. Okay, they were willing to fight for what is right. But they have a very simple-minded approach. They, again, they wanted to bring peace to Iraq. They wanted to bring women's rights to Afghanistan. And I don't want to bring peace to the Palestinians. Okay, I mean, think about it. What is it that you sure will not happen? Here you have three examples. Would they still need to say so? Yes. Would anything come out of it? No. Do I mind faking it? No, I'll fake it. Okay, if I must. And some other time when we speak, because I'm sure we're about to end now, I want to speak about what's happening in America. Because let give me us just, a teaser. Let me give you a teaser. The number one threat, or let me start earlier. If you want a democratic, open-minded society, you need nationalism. Because if you don't have a system of solidarity, you cannot have a democracy and an open society. Now, What threatened and almost eliminated nationalism? Our lesson from the Second World War, the wrong lesson, that nationalism must deteriorate into chauvinism, into fascism, and into Nazism, in the so-called slippery slope. Okay? Now, it's a dumb approach, it's a twisted approach, but people were persuaded by it. So what happened? Europe lost its attachment to nationalism, and only the Ukraine war is bringing it back, thank God, to Europe, and Putin saved Europe from going further in the wrong direction. In the same way, progressivism is threatening liberalism. Because when you take liberalism to the extreme, to the very extreme, to the lunatic extreme, then you're giving liberalism a bad name. And again, look at Europe. This idea, let's be open. 
and everybody can come in, brought into Europe a terrible population in terms of the chances that it will integrate. And it doesn't matter what color of skin it is. You can come with a dark color of skin and be a Muslim from India and you will be integrated. And you can come from Afghanistan or from Syria and you will not be integrated. But the Europeans brought into Europe tens of millions of people who will not be integrated. What is the result? Europe is now changing not from the left to the center as I would have wanted, but from the left to the radical right, okay? And you have these forces growing in Germany, particularly in Eastern Lander, you in Sweden, in Denmark, in Netherlands, in Italy, throughout Europe. So the response to one extreme is the other extreme. And therefore, what we have in the United States today in progressivism undermines the very basic distinction between civilized people and barbarians. They support barbarians because they have enough pigments to be supported, because they're weak enough to be supported. And if you're weak, you must be an angel. And if you're weak, you must be a, 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 a victim. And if you're a victim, you're an angel. And if you're strong, you must be a genocidal force. And they twist it. What you have today among progressive, not all of them, but a very large extent, and we've seen the ridiculous expression in American universities, you have an immoral approach, basically forgetting the distinction between good and bad. And this is threatening liberalism. Now, what is the impact on Israel? Israel is a Jewish democratic state. Namely, we need both nationalism and liberalism. If we don't have this combination, Jews would not want to live here, Jews would not come here, Jews will not stay here. So, when nationalism is threatened, we are in bad shape, and when liberalism is threatened, we are in bad shape. And liberalism has been eroded since the 1960s, my favorite statement of a liberal, and you will per be perhaps one of the few who will know who the person is, said, who said, power corrupts, weakness corrupts absolutely. In other words, he took Luke Ac Lord Acton's uh, dictum and turned it uh, in, in, in a different direction. Oh. Adlai Stevenson, my favorite kind of liberal, Okay, who also said a liberal is a man with his two feet firmly planted in the air. Okay, <laughs> so liberalism, we can't do without liberalism and progressivism is threatening liberalism. So when nationalism and liberalism are threatened, we Israelis have a problem because we want to keep a combination of Jewish nationalism and democratic liberalism. So next time when we speak, this is a good subject to discuss. Very Dr. Dan Shiftan, thank you so much. Always for a your pleasure. Time. Fascinating. Really appreciate it. You have bad taste. <laughs> <laughs> See you thank the next you time. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks for tuning in.